Hello, good afternoon, all. Uh, welcome to our uh, first afternoon session. Uh, we are here to talk about treatment responses through a community justice lens. My name is Christopher Heinrich. I'm a senior program manager at the Center for Court Innovation on the training and technical assistance team. I'm really excited to um, spend this time thinking about and talking about discussing how community justice initiatives, including community courts, um, respond to treatment needs and substance use treatment needs, um, and how uh, we can think about best practices when it comes to um, treatment um, and how they intersect with the justice system. So today's session, um, we're going to have an interesting format. We're starting with um, Dr. Michael McGee, um, who's a psychiatrist based in California. Dr. McGee is um, certified, a uh, board certified in general psychiatry, addiction psychiatry, and psychosomatic medicine. Um, he has directed several treatment programs, participated in government-funded outcomes research, and has published in areas of spirituality, addictions, and clinical treatment. Um, we're excited to have him kick us off today with a brief presentation um, on best practices for treatment currently in the field of psychiatry um, and addictions uh, medicine. So um, once uh, Dr. McGee finishes his presentation. We'll then welcome two other panelists uh, to our session, um, Judge Wang from Midtown Community Court and Scott Carlson from Las Vegas, Nevada, who will join us for a conversation about how um, best practices for treatment overlap with the needs of the criminal justice system and the, and the people that we work with. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. McGee, to um, introduce yourself and start uh, your presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, it's good to be with you all. I'm going to start my presentation here. Uh, I, I'm going to be talking uh, give sort of a lightning quick overview of what uh, good treatment looks like in justice settings, and particularly the community justice setting, uh, and basically sort of give you a distilled version of what is generally, uh, for me, usually a one or two day training. So uh, fasten your seatbelts. We're going to go through these principles very quickly. I'm hoping you'll just get sort of get the essence or just sort of the overall higher level principles, and, and maybe it will pique your interest in doing a deeper dive into the art of providing this kind of care in a justice setting. So um, I um, I just want to uh, just let you know that uh, uh, some resources that I think are relevant here, the ASAM criteria, very, very helpful. Uh, I've written a couple of books, as you can see here, on, on addiction and recovery. And then a colleague of mine and a mentor, William Miller, has a really good book on uh, what what enhances clinical outcomes called effective psychotherapists. Uh, so what's really um, important when it comes to understanding what works in treatment is that really most of the benefit of treatment comes from uh, extra therapeutic uh, issues like the environment. Uh, the the the, uh, the the treatment courts, for example, are a huge impact on outcomes family, uh, the, the environment situation. And treatment has really a relatively small contribution to the benefits of, uh, of, of people's recovery. Not that treatment is not important, but we need to keep this all in, in perspective. And, uh, and really, of, of the impact of treatment that really makes the most difference is forming a, a trusting relationship where there's a feeling of hope and that the work that we're doing together is 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 meaningful and, and is going to work, and that would be the alliance and the allegiance. And really, only about eight percent, roughly, of outcomes uh, of good outcomes, due to actually uh, providing uh, the proper technique uh, for treatment. Somewhat humbling, but but this is an important perspective to keep in mind. Um, so I think that when we're looking at the alliance, what we're looking at is having a trusting relationship where people feel cared for and, and respected. And, and then there's an agreement with the participant on what it is that, that we are going to work on together, the goals and impairment in public safety, uh, but in doing so in a way that also uh, meets what the participant wants to achieve in their life. 
So uh, agreement on goals and then on how to achieve those goals. Uh, it turns out that in doing this work, when you look at the therapeutic alliance, there's huge differences uh, in clinical outcomes that are related to the interpersonal skills of, of a therapist. And some therapists with poor interpersonal skills actually harm patients. So it really matters not only what you're doing with a patient, but how you do it in terms of your, your interpersonal uh, skills with, with, with your patients. Um, and those skills that improve outcomes are, are uh, there's a number that have been evidence-based. Uh, accurate empathy is by far the most important one. But then there's uh, others like acceptance and positive regard, um, which I think are really rooted in sort of a capacity to be not judgmental towards people who engage in harmful behaviors. Um, so again, uh, this book, Effective Psychotherapist for the Clinicians in the, in the Audience, is, is a superb reference for that. I think if you look at sort of the far side of, of all these different clinical skills, what we see that Carl Rogers wrote about many years ago is this idea of coming to therapeutic presence, which is having sort of a caring, um, again, non-judgmental, um, uh, active presence uh, with people. Uh, and, and this is by far the most important factor in terms of uh, good clinical outcomes. Uh, and when this is combined with clinical skill, then we really optimize the benefits for our participants. So one of the issues here is, is that it needs to be a participant-centered treatment plan. And, and it used to be, you know, in, in my training growing up, it was sort of like my way or the highway. And uh, if you didn't want it, and it was, it was AA and 90 and 90. And, uh, and then if you didn't do it the way that I told you, then you were basically attacked and, and, uh, and, and, and called names and, and basically... Uh, shamed if you didn't want to do treat, work on the goals that I wanted you to work on the way that I want you to work on them. So I, I think in terms of understanding many people where they're at, we need to understand that the people are are different are at different stages of change. Um, and and some people are they don't see, they think they have a problem at all, so they're in pre contemplation. And others are like oh boy, I keep getting arrested. Maybe my alcohol use is a factor in this. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Or maybe people are uh, preparing to change. Like, I, I really do want to quit. I, I'm going to work on getting it, you know, getting uh, a leave of absence and, and go to a rehab or something like that. And then there's, uh, so there, so really understanding uh, and assessing where somebody is at in the stage of change is super, super important. For example, if somebody's in pre-contemplation, we want to do discovery work with them rather than recovery work. And so meeting people where they're at uh, is so important for doing this work effectively. And here's an example of sort of what, uh, of a picture of this sort of spiral of, of the, the stages of change. And people can go back and forth between these. Somebody might be in action and, and then in maintenance and then get complacent and forget all the harm that happened and then re be right back in pre-contemplation. And people can be in different stages for different issues. Like somebody may, may say, boy, I really got to stop using heroin, but, but marijuana is fine. And so uh, we need to also have a sense of where are they at in, 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 their, in their process with all of the different uh, issues that are addressing them. We see the example here that this is somebody who really has a problem with hangovers. And it might be, you might say, what can I do about, I, I keep getting arrested, um, a doctor. And and then here, here the person says, well, you can stop drinking alcoholic beverages. And, and he says, no, seriously, what can I do? <laughs> and you can see here that the issue for him is not, he doesn't, he's not wanting to stop drinking. He just wants to get rid of the hangovers. And many participants don't want to stop using drugs and alcohol, but they want to stop getting arrested, right? Or, or they want to get the, the cord off of their back. So it's really meeting people where they're at um, and not imposing our own agenda on them. At the same time, um, you know, we, we also don't want to sort of leave people flailing. I mean, people do need help uh, to recover. Uh, and we all need each other's help to get by. Um, so, um, uh, it, well, it needs to be participant-centered, and we need to 
hold our participants accountable for doing the work that they need to do, they also need our help too. So there's a middle road there. So a part of that is, is really a, a, a setting up a treatment contract at the, at the beginning of treatment that the participant agrees to. You know, what do they want to do? Why do they want to do it? How are they going to do it? And where and when? So uh, we really want to start with, well, what does the client want? And and why? And 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 how do they want to get where they want to get? And and, and when do they want to uh, get there? Now we have to merge that. This is the real art, and maybe the most difficult part of clinical care is also merging what the client's view of things is with our own. Like, like what do we feel that they need, and why do we feel they need it, and how? What do we think would be best for them to do, or to receive, or get in order to achieve what we would feel would be good goals for them? So then uh, that comes to then negotiating the treatment plan. So what is the contract? In other words, what, what is the need that they're, they, they've agreed to sign up, for example, for a, a community court uh, and, and to engage in treatment? So what, what are the boundaries of that? And uh, how have we linked what we think that they need to what they want? That's the art, linking what, we, what they need in our, in our sense of things to what they want. And can we get the client to buy into that link and then refer them to the proper level of care and do so in a timely way? Uh, I think this is the most important part of, of uh, providing good treatment right here. And it is quite a, a complex skill and a real art to do that. So we have an example here of putting this in place of Carl, who's an 18 year old uh, man who has a uh, two psychiatric illnesses, alcohol and cannabis use disorders uh, with occasional cocaine use. We're not quite sure about that. Um, uh, and uh, he doesn't think he has a problem. He's in pre-contemplation, but everybody else around him thinks he has a problem. And he's really uh, engaged in behavior uncharacteristic for him of uh, petty theft and shoplifting uh, and has had a real decline in work and so everybody around him sees these these concerns and threats to public safety and his own um, impairment as due to his, his uh, drug use, drug and alcohol usage. Um, and he and his sister is really quite concerned as well. Uh, so uh, his whole family and network is seeing that there's a problem here. And um, uh, Carl is denying a problem. And as you can see here, when they find um, marijuana and crack cocaine, which really are against the, the the stipulations of his probation, he says, oh, he's just holding them for a friend. So um, the question is, what does Carl want? What does he want? Uh, does he want to get sober? Does he even see that he has a problem? Uh, and I would propose that if we think about this, what Carl really wants is for everybody to get off his back. He doesn't want to go to jail. He wants his probation officer off his back and his sister off his back. He just wants to be uh, left alone. So that's a good place to start in terms of negotiating a treatment contract. Um, again, I think you know, otherwise, if, if we sort of lecture people what they need, you, know, you, need, you need to stop using alcohol and marijuana and, co and crack cocaine. And here's the best way to do that. You should go to AA or NA and uh, you should work with me on... Um, you know, developing uh, other ways to manage your cravings. Uh, if we're if that's not where they're at or what they want, they're 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 going to say, well, they're not convinced that's the best strategy. And by the way, they weren't even listening to you to begin with. So, this is really really important. What happens is because there's a mismatch between what we see that people need, we discern that they need, and where they're at and what they want. That leads to us then labeling them as resistant. And, and really, it's not that they're resistant. It's that the resistance arises in the relationship. It's, it's a result of an, of an interaction where we're just not on the same page with them. And, and that's what's really critical is to see that it's not a pathology. It's, it's, it's a result of, of an interaction of, of them with us. Same thing with being unmotivated. I mean, if they're in the office with you, they are motivated for something. For example, maybe they are motivated that they don't want to have to 
uh, have face further legal consequences or they want to get their family back. Um, uh, so to say that they're unmotivated, it, it really, it, it's that they're not motivated perhaps maybe to, to stop using drugs and alcohol, but they are certainly motivated to have less pain in their lives. And so, uh, you know, they're ready for something. It's just a sense of what are they motivated and ready for and how can we meet them where they're at? So what happens is when, when people uh, aren't doing what we think they should do, we, we basically call them names <laughs> and negatively judge them. And uh, this is quite judgmental and quite unempathic and really quite unhelpful. And you can see that there's some shaming in this as well. And so uh, we act out our own frustration uh, when people don't do what we think they should do by judging and shaming them. And that's something we need to be mindful of. It's normal, it's natural, it's human, we all do it. it. The trick is awareness for us to see this and then to metabolize our own judgment, judgmental and shaming behavior and realize that the problem is in the interaction and not in the person, okay? And so, you know, it's telling people what they should do uh, as part of a court order and having them just comply so they don't have to go to jail or whatever. Um, is not really good treatment. Um, he says here, I, I really can't explain it too much except to say it's part of a court order. So uh, we really want to have participant buy into something that's meaningful for them. And this brings us to the issue of compliance versus adherence. G traditionally in justice systems, we're talking about control and comply and, and really uh, you, you know uh, wanting to sort of have people uh, to promote public safety, to do what to do what they're supposed to do, cooperate. So cooperation and control, um, and then core, uh, sometimes consequences. Right? We have old behavioral models of punishment and reward that that really don't don't work as effectively uh, as as, uh, as as other as uh, as this kind of approach that I'm talking about here. We want uh, to base promote adherence to people doing work that they need to do to change their attitudes, their, their thinking, their understandings and their behaviors uh, because they truly want to do it because they see that that is in their best interest. So um, the other thing I, I just want to point is that we work with, with addictions in a context of this is a highly stigmatized illness, right? And, and it's not, like if you have diabetes, um, uh, you know, people don't think you're bad because you have diabetes, but because of the illness of addiction is kind of, it's in a way, it's it's almost like maybe like having COVID. Like if somebody had COVID, you would you quarantine them because their illness could harm you. And the fact is that when you have the illness of addiction, that can harm other people too, and and does harm a lot of people. I mean, addiction is a disorder of the brain that that leads to harmful consequences for others. And that leads to basically negative and judgmental um, ways of thinking about people who suffer from addiction. So it's very important that we provide, that we work beyond that and really change our own language and not call people addicts or having dirty urines or saying, or even saying when they're clean. I, I, when somebody will tell me they're clean, I'll say, well, when you were, when you were suffering from your illness, does that mean you were dirty? So uh, this is really important that we... Uh, that we be mindful of our, our language. Uh, same thing about, um, you know, people, a lot of the people that we treat have significant trauma and a neglect, and they didn't learn how to be in the world in a collaborative and mutual assertive uh, way that where they had found sort of that, that, that magical capacity to be both autonomous and interdependent in loving and harmonious ways. So they have they have impairments uh, in their in their relational skills, and so rather than saying that they're not skilled at getting their needs met, we call them names again with these harsh judgmental terms, uh, manipulative, attention seeking. So again, if you want to have a good therapeutic alliance, you need to sort of see all of this and and really move beyond these kinds of negative judgments of people who are harmful. We need to locate the badness of what happens in what was done and not in the person. It's super important core principle in a justice involved setting. So, you know, after you've uh, created a participant centered treatment plan that makes sense and that meets the, the, the judicial mandates for public safety, 
that you need to expect that that treatment plan is not going to work. The treatment you put in place is not going to work. You should expect that. There's going to be obstacles. There's deviations. You're going to try things that are not going to work. At that point, you then need to adjust and adapt and continuously uh, update the treatment plan based on feedback. So you need to have measurement-based, feedback-informed, flexible, uh, adaptive, iterative treatment. So the treatment plan is a dynamic uh, sort of plan that changes and changes as our formulations develop and as we try things and as some things work and as other things don't work, okay? Now, in terms of a multidimensional assessment, I, I'm just gonna refer you briefly to the ASAM criteria. Uh, the, these are really very good criteria or dimensions of assessment for pretty much anybody. Uh, their acute intoxication or withdrawal potential, medical problems, other psychiatric illnesses, where are they at in the stage of change process? What is their risk of ongoing use or relapse? Um, for example, if somebody has opiate use disorder, well, we know that with NA and, and the best treatment, they have a 90% 90, 90 chance of, of, of re-addicting in a year. And that really, unless we get them engaged in, in, in having med a medication for opiate use disorder, like now Trexlin or buprenorphine or, or methadone, that they're, they're going to have 90% a poor outcome no matter what. Um, so again, assessing that and having that help determine what would be the best treatment. And then recovery environment is huge. I like to say that people need to be in a safe, supportive, stable, low stress, structured, supervised, sober environment with proper sequelae for positive behavior, <laughs> uh, what I call an 8S environment. Um, okay. And then, you know, obviously uh, the, those criteria then lead to, to uh, thoughts about levels of service or intensities of service. Uh, and these are a combination of both clinical uh, services such as housing and, and sort of the, the environment of care as, and, as well as um, uh, social work services and then also clinical services. And this can go anywhere from a very low early intervention or preventative care, outpatient, intensive outpatient, uh, uh, residential. Uh, if somebody, for example, it really needs a supervised detoxification and they, are, they don't have a safe environment that might be needed. And then rarely, you know, somebody, let's say, who's in acute liver failure or having delirium tremens or, or uh, alcohol withdrawal seizures may need a hospital level of care. So in terms of what we do in treatment, um, I, I, I have this, I, uh, the seven M's of treatment. Um, and we, we basically are working to motivate, manage, and mediate uh, the care that people receive and provide mentoring and, and medications and then promote meetings and then monitor people's outcomes and, and how they're doing uh, in, in these various different ASAM dimensions. Um, so this is a good way to sort of think about all the things that we do uh, in terms of promoting good outcomes. Now, it's really important that, uh, you know, I, 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 that we understand that, the, that mental illnesses are unique and that they really require a collaborative care with social services and community services. Uh, unlike, uh, I mean, this is the case for other medical illnesses as well, but in particular for mental illnesses, there's a real need to involve family and recovery supports and, and really have a collaborated and integrated care through uh, interagency agreements and hopefully have everybody on the same page with the same formulation and with the same participant-centered uh, treatment plan. You, you won't get good outcomes without having this. This is super, super important. And obviously, uh, treatment's not always going to go um, well. In fact, treatment will never go well all the time, right? In, in other words, you should expect to have difficulties and obstacles and poor outcomes. And when that happens, rather than getting mad or discouraged or blaming the patient, you should say, of course, of course, things aren't working out well, of course, right? So that's an opportunity to then assess what's working, what's not. And then again, have an iterative, adaptive, iterative treatment plan that changes over and over and over again. 
in order to try new things and address what's not working. Um, and then also make sure that you check the treatment contract um, if, if a participant is not able to modify the treatment plan. And, and if for whatever reasons you've done everything you can and, and you're not able to engage the participant in, in what makes sense to them, then, then to really, and hold them accountable for that, then, then maybe um, you know, check with the contract and maybe refer it back to the ju judicial system if, if it just there isn't the willingness to, um, to comply with the treatment contract. Uh, we should really be expecting people to do treatment and not time and to really see evidence that they are making efforts to make changes in their attitudes, their understandings, and their behaviors that's consistent with what they want to achieve in their lives to the degree to which they are capable. And we want to have policies that per permit mistakes and honesty. A zero tolerance policy just will not permit honesty. And so uh, we really want to have uh, moving away from punitive sanctions as much as possible to rewards and recognition and incentives uh, and also the ability for people to try things and, and, and not do well. And I mean, addiction is one of the rare illnesses where we actually kind of punish people for showing symptoms of their illness, right? Uh, we, you're in treatment because you can't control your compulsions to drink. And then if you drink, then we kick you out of treatment, uh, and, which just doesn't make any sense. Uh, and then obviously we want to track outcomes in real time, uh, change, functional changes in attitudes, thoughts, and behaviors so that we're not just tracking our people attending sessions and passively doing time rather than doing treatment, okay? Now, at, at some point, you know, if they don't stop using, uh, you know, we just kick them out, right? And and, and really, the there's no blank answer to that, right? If somebody is struggling with this illness, our, traditionally what we've done is we blame the patient rather than that the treatment's not effective or that the alliance is not where it needs to be or that we're not meeting the patient where they're at. Maybe they need to be more in, in a discovery phase rather than a, re, a, a discovery dropout prevention phase rather than a recovery relapse prevention phase. And so again, that's really up to us to, to look to look at that and, um, and and really go back to the treatment plan and check the contract. And some people may take years to, to really achieve recovery because they have so much trauma or so much character damage. And so it's really uh, working pacing, patiently with people where they're at and, and never giving up, always having hope for the patient is so important, okay? So, you know, a lot of times we, we want to do well for people. They're in the community court setting and we see that they're homeless and they're, they keep shoplifting or whatever. And we, and, and they're, they're refusing treatment for their psychosis. So, oh, I've got my, my alarm here. Um, so um, uh, my warning here, I think we're going to be on time. So, uh, you know, we, we, we want to help them. And as you can see here, um, our friend here wants to give some bread to the birds. And when he runs outside to give them the bread, they all fly away. And he says, well, they, I guess they, did, they weren't very hungry. Well, really the question is, what is it that the birds really needed and wanted, right? And, and how can we meet them where they're at with what they need and want in a way that also coincides with, with really the, the responsibility and the mandate that they have if they want to have the privilege of freedom and benefiting from living in an interdependent society, then they need to take responsibility for this mandate for public safety and and uh, and and obeying the law. So, how do we help them to sort of face that existential challenge that they have if they want to maintain their privilege of, of living in a free society? So, uh, again, I, I think you see the point here from this cartoon. Now, I think it's important that we all recognize that we all have our own vulnerabilities. So we as clinicians, for example, we may be so participant-centered uh, and, and deep in our empathy that we may lose track of the fact that there is this external public safety mandate that we really need to hold patients accountable or participants accountable for uh, attending to. That is a reality uh, that they must address. Uh, for their own benefit. And on the other hand, the, the judicial side of things, uh, sometimes you'll see um, 
The judges, for example, prescribe 90 meetings in 90 days or go to residential treatment, which is really not the role of the, ju the ju judiciary. Their, their role is to know what good treatment looks like and to really make sure that, that based on clinicians' good assessments that they're developing a patient-centered, multidimensional, uh, phase-appropriate treatment plan that is adaptive and iterative, iterative with, and this measurement-based treatment and this feedback-informed and that pay, and that this treatment is effective in getting accountable change, changes in attitudes, understandings, and behaviors. So if that's going on, then then the judiciary, you know, they 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 don't have to sort of prescribe treatment or 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 mandate, you know, punishments. Um, so uh, and it looks like uh, that is um, the end of my presentation. So. Uh, uh, I'll open it up now to our dialogue. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. McGee, um, for, for that presentation. You can go ahead and stop sharing your screen. Um, and we are bringing on two more panelists to uh, have a discussion. Um, so really appreciate you kind of grounding our audience and our panel in the best practices related to treatment from your point of view as a psychiatrist. We're now going to welcome um, two, two additional panelists to our conversation, Judge Wang and Scott Carlson. I'm going to briefly introduce these two fine gentlemen and then uh, move forward into further introductions from their own voices and a conversation between uh, the three panelists today. So uh, first, we have uh, Judge Honorable John Zhao Wang, who's the presiding judge of the Midtown Community Court and a New York City criminal court judge. Um, so he has the viewpoint of being both in a more traditional system as well as a community court system. Uh, prior to his appointment on the bench, he was a principal law clerk in the New York State Supreme Court and for the former administrative judge of the New York uh, city civil court. Um, and Scott Carlson has worked in the private sector in the past with several agencies and has spent the last three years with the Las Vegas Justice Courts in Nevada, where he currently serves as a specialty court coordinator. Um, he and his colleagues created Las Vegas's misdemeanor treatment court program from the ground up. So we're welcoming the judge and Scott to help us bridge this conversation between the world of uh, the clinical world of psychiatry and, and treatment uh, to to the, the criminal justice field and um, and to community justice specifically. So with that, I'll give the mic to Judge Wang to um, give us a bit of a background of, um, of the program you're coming from. And then Scott will have the same opportunity before we have a dialogue. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, John Wang. Uh, I am the uh, presiding judge of Midtown Community Court. I started there in January of this year. Um, before that, I was in criminal court full time. Now um, I'm in criminal court Monday through Thursdays. And then on Fridays, um, I'm in Midtown uh, Community Court. I want to just share a little bit about my experiences um, very briefly uh, with respect to the misdemeanor mental health court. Uh, that is what I uh, where I work. Uh, there is an overlap with substance um, abuse, um, but primarily the part is dedicated to uh, mis those who are charged with misdemeanors, which is a little bit of a misnomer because we also take low-level felonies, nonviolent felonies, um, and uh, bring them into the part. Uh, anyone is eligible for that um, uh, for the part, uh, so long as the charge is el eligible. And I, as I said, um, we also do take felonies, but they have to be reduced to misdemeanors in order for them to kind of pass through the part. Um, misdemeanors in the state of New York generally mean jail sentences that are less than a year long, ranging from everything from theft uh, to assault. Um, and the idea of um, misdemeanor mental health court and the idea of the part that we have in Midtown Community Court is rapid, early, meaningful engagement in social services. Um, these are pre-plea uh, cases, meaning the individual has been arrested, um, but before there is a disposition of the case, uh, they're getting involved in the part, uh, which always includes a assessment, which follows very quickly in time to their appearance or referral to the part, so we don't lose them. 
Um, that's with a licensed social worker, one of the many great clinicians we have in Midtown Community Court. Um, there's no mandates um, in the sense that engagement in the part is voluntary. Um, and so the recommendations that come out of there and the sessions, uh, the session model that we use is also voluntary. Uh, that also that does mean that if they don't participate in the part, uh, then we have to decide what we're going to do uh, with this particular um, case. Uh, but we make them, we let them know the assessment is voluntary, uh, engaging in the services is, is voluntary. But the more meaningfully you engage in these services, uh, more likely the outcome of this case will be better. Uh, meaning the 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 out disposition of the case will be more favorable. Um, and this is really based on the idea of the scaffolding of support uh, to address what are the concrete immediate needs that this person may have, which is why all of the um, sessions are, or at least the assessment is really kind of based off of this idea of um, what do you what do you need right away? Uh, what are your goals as Dr. McGee um, had said? And um, what can we do to help stabilize you at this time. That could be benefits counseling. It could be individual account counseling, group counseling, peer navigator um, counseling. It could be harm reduction um, uh, services. And those are all the kinds of services that are offered through the Midtown Court, which happens right there in that uh, courthouse. That's another wonderful feature, as I'm sure many of you have heard about community courts. Um, this is misdemeanor land, um, and so the number of sessions are generally between one to five uh, because we want to avoid entrapment. We want to avoid entanglement of these folks in terms of being involved in the court. And I think, as Dr. McGee had said, really it's important that we meet them where they are. Um, we have graduated participants for whom I think this experience was life-changing. They're never going to be arrested again. It's going to be wonderful. And, you know, we've graduated participants who've struggled. Um, and as we've gone, as we, as we're starting to look at the data of the participants that's gone through, we're seeing that. Um, and so I think I agree with Dr. McGee wholeheartedly that to the extent that we have these participants come back, uh, meeting them where they were and then meeting them where they are maybe in future cases is the goal and, and to try to help them. Um, and I do wanna just say one thing about the part that we have, uh, which I think is really important, which is so much of the, um, the effort and so much of what we're trying to do is really meaningfully help them, uh, which is not duplicating services because many of these participants have been assessed to death. Um, it is really about trying to get them the services that they need right then and there, and then hopefully beginning that conversation uh, so that they can engage further voluntarily. So I'm going to now turn it over to Scott. Uh, thank you, Judge. Uh, my name is Scott Carlson. I'm a, like Chris said, I'm a community court coordinator for the Las Vegas Justice Courts. Uh, I'm a court coordinator in community court and also uh, what we help create misdemeanor treatment court. I'm also a court coordinator in uh, veterans treatment court. Um, I am also a... Um, graduate of a drug court myself uh, in 2010. Um, and since then, I am now going on uh, 12 years clean and sober, uh, where I've uh, gone back to college, received my master's degree in clinical mental health counseling, and now I am a licensed drug and alcohol counselor in the state of Nevada. So and I, I coming from a very unique perspective on treatment courts and the anxiety of even just going into court, um, and a lot of what Dr. McGee has said in his presentation is extremely relative. Um, when I was going back then, um, almost 12 years ago, into that kind of uh, environment, it was very anxious and anxiety, and it was very much a uh, totalitarian kind of thing. You need to do this or that's going to happen. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here today in order to uh, be that uh, voice and, and help everyone kind of change that narrative. Because uh, like Dr. McGee said, these these individuals who suffer from the disease of like homelessness or quality of life crimes or addictions um, feel a, feel a certain way about courts as well as well as courts feel about them, and it's it's changing that in order to become more in sync with uh, trying to be just uh, more understanding. Um, so, community court originally here in Las Vegas was created in 2017 on a, from a BJA grant, um, where the it was aimed towards helping those that are. Uh, have quality of life crimes and get citations, or as like I like to call them now, invitations to come to court, um, 
to uh, like trespass, nine mine burglary, um, lodge in a building without a permission, um, you know, uh, selling into uh, liquor without a license, um, consuming liquor where uh, in front of where it's uh, purchased, uh, petty larceny, right? Um, so, and also use of uh, possession of paraphernalia. I mean, all these things uh, uh, are citations and, and, and they do get sent here. Uh, but before community court was created or misdemeanor treatment court was created, these individuals would get these low level misdemeanor citations and they would get credit time served and it would be that revolving door uh, that the doctor and the judge was was talking about. And uh, so they're just, they would just get these credit time served or spend a few days in jail and then get right out and, and it's someone else's problem. But the goal of community courts is it's not someone else's problem. It's all of our problem. And, and that's what we need to hear, be here to say is to develop those partnerships between the courts and to be, to be uh, between like the private sector or uh, nonprofit organizations to say, hey, come over here. We have this community court organization that's trying to help these individuals from that revolving door. Um, so when, you know, when we created that misdemeanor treatment court, which kind of evolved from from community court as like a uh, we got grant funding um, for a two year grant from the BJA uh, to create an extension of uh, the community court program we already had in place to then have a nine month long uh, kind of a treatment court model that's connected with community court where they would get complete sober living, drug treatment, uh, they get access to welfare, social services, therapy uh, for co-occurring disorders, MAT. I mean, if we wrote in to pay for everything uh, for nine months um, and we had individuals uh, say that that would never work, why would anyone agree to do something for that long uh, when they're just getting credit time served? Well, I'm here to tell you, you know, 15 graduates later, and 60 total participants who are no longer homeless and are in treatment right now um, beg to differ. Uh, the numbers are there to prove that and it's and it's very much there and, and I, I see it every day and it's amazing. So making those partnerships and, and showing that these programs and these, uh, this, this, like I like what Dr. McGee said as well is that like, I almost like, I'm like a realtor and it's all about, you know, what realtors do, it's location, location, location. And, and I feel like what I do and what the courts do is motivation, 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 right? To get them, meet them where they're at, just yeah. to keep that engagement going, right? And offer them this stuff. And then 99.9% .9 of the time when I talk to these participants, no one's ever offered me treatment. And they've had 55 to 60 citations and they've been in and out of jail 55 times. Like what? Like, and we, we've missed the boat. So uh, basically like that's kind of how that works. And then to build those partnerships, we have clean the world showers that come here because a lot of people, homeless individuals, they, why wouldn't they come to court? Well, they haven't had a shower. They feel a certain way. And a lot of people feel I need to go to court dressed a certain way. So we have shower trucks here. It's the only individual shower trucks in all of Las Vegas, Nevada, where these individuals could get a private shower for 20 minutes. We have uh, also other nonprofits there that will wash their clothes for them. And then they, maybe that will come to court and they have. And our court uh, has increased almost 20% show up rate from that. Um, so I don't want to, uh, I could continue rambling on about how great this stuff is, but uh, it, it's interesting that uh, Dr. McGee is that um, I actually wrote down a question while you were speaking that I thought of um, that would kind of tie into all this. And uh, I was, uh, let me see what I wrote down here. So um, from your perspective, you know, given who you are and the specializing that you do in substance use treatment, um, do you think stakeholders and staff like myself in the criminal justice system or context, uh, what do they need to keep in front of their minds when, consider when considering how to build the legal process and programming for people who are struggling with substance use? Yeah, okay, so thank you. Well, I think, I think the first thing that you mentioned, Scott, and, and I, I, you're a great example of this, is you have this capacity for, de for developing trusting, caring, uh, compassionate relationships with people who are really hurting and understanding their needs from their perspective. So uh, it's really that that is the core thing. And if, so, for example, let's say somebody keeps um, trespassing or, or uh, engaging in petty theft or whatever. Yeah, but they have no interest in giving up their heroin habit or their methamphetamine habit, right, at all. Um, and maybe they're psychotic from their methamphetamine usage. Uh, but what they what they really would like, though, is is a safe place to live and uh, and uh, and a place where they can have their valuables not be stolen. And they and, and where they not, I feel like they're not quite at risk of assault. So meeting them where they're at. I mean, there are. I think the housing first model for homeless people, for example, 
Uh, that does work if it's combined with the availability of, of assertive community treatment and other clinical resources. So it's really like like you said, forming a relationship and then uh, you know sort of warming your hands with them by the fire of their dilemma, which is how do I stay out of jail, right? Or how do I stay out of court? Uh, by by then meeting meeting their their core needs, maybe their their on um, Maslow's hierarchy, maybe their core survival needs and safety needs uh, to begin with. Maybe that's where they're at. That would be one example. Um, I, I'm I'm interested. Um, uh, 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 Judge uh, Judge Wang, um, you know, it's true that uh, psychiatry and the justice system have a lot of challenges in, in aligning their lenses as a field with regard to this topic, but it seems to be happening in, in your sites. Um, so I'm just wondering how how have you made that real? Um, how is your how is your your roles as a specialty court coordinator and judge help bridge the gap for the benefit of people who are cycling through the system? Yeah, thank you. So I think part of the shift that has occurred, and this was brought to, I think brought up by Dr. McGee, was this uh, idea of having a clinically informed um, treatment plan uh, versus one in which the legal providers are dictating um, in, to in totality what is supposed to happen in a particular case. The, the reality is they both have to live together. Uh, there is an existing case that is, um, you know, uh, happening. And so um, in many ways, I am constrained, even though I may think that in particular cases, one solution is better than another. Um, the, the, the DA's office or the district attorney's office here will have some say in that. Um, they control the universe of dispositional options. Um, so uh, I think one thing that I'm trying to work very hard is to talk to the legal providers and let them know that the clinicians are um, empowered and they should be empowered. Uh, to make recommendations that we should all uh, consider because we're just we don't really how can we pretend to know more than they do um, about what the treatment needs are for the defendants uh, who have uh, mental health issues or substance abuse um, issues um, and i think part of that is then opening it up to the sessions model where there are different sessions that assist them discrete uh, short time framed uh, sessions that will um, help them through a particular discrete issue that they're experiencing in a court like community court, which is uh, not the, or which are low level offenses. Um, I think that there are some, um, you know, that that's one of the obstacles is the communication that the legal providers and the clinicians have to have together. I think both sides need to understand why their incentive structures look the way they do. Um, and that's something that I try to kind of do in terms of cross pollinating the clinical staff here at Midtown uh, with some of the legal expertise that I might have, but also then bring the the the, the lawyers into the part and having them speak to the social workers so that they understand what's going on on their end. Um, uh, that's I think important to kind of continue to bring those to have those conversations or create spaces uh, for those um, conversations. I also think that one of the big differences in terms of the effectiveness is the contrast between downtown and midtown, right? Between what a traditional court model looks like in a community court. In community court, we engage in um, procedural justice. Not that that doesn't happen downtown, but because of the volume and because of the kind of culture, it's difficult to foster that. You know, we engage in positive interviewing. We have warm handoffs. We engage in gradual graduation ceremonies. All of those are the culture that we build in Midtown and in community courts to create the support that I think many of these participants need. And I think some of them who have been arrested many, many times see that contrast and they feel that support and it helps them to engage um, um, more meaningfully or feel like this is a different space for them to be able to be more honest, for them to be able to seek help and maybe hopefully for them to kind of um, engage in the action in that um, multi-step process that you were talking about, Dr. McGee. Yeah, yeah and, and I want to piggyback on that. Thank you, Judge. Um, so, and, and that is our role is to, to bridge the gap, right? Um, and to kind of like, you know, like as far as the judges is, uh, in your role, Judge, is to uh, ensure community safety. So if this person's homeless and out there using stuff like that, how do we help with that community safety of what this person might do or what might happen to them? Uh, in that context, but in our our role is uh, clinicians and the motivators to get their buy-in. Um, 
and to provide the treatment for them to overcome the obstacles that are ailing them at that time that led to where they're at. Um, uh, you know, a lot of that has to do with, um, you know, what is success? You know, the court has its own idea of what success is. We all have our own perspective of what's mine's much different than someone else's. Um, if they're showing up that day, well, guess what? They're getting a standing ovation because that's a huge ordeal for someone, you know, um, e even if they are intoxicated or, or whatever. But I mean, who's to say that that's the wrong thing to do when these individuals have maybe been homeless 20 years and they have no social skills. And the only way they do interact with people is when they're under the influence because they've had some traumatic event happen to them in their lives to cause these behavioral responses uh, and let them to this down the path that they're currently in. Um, so uh, for us to say that, that they shouldn't be doing that um, is kind of like obtuse because that's all they know how to do. So it's almost like a intended response, but beating where they're at, not judging them on that and, and, and appreciating that they came. So something inside of them was motivating them to come. I mean, we've had since the pandemic, uh, a major decrease in individuals that would show up for court, uh, community court, because community court stayed ongoing throughout the pandemic. And we had... Uh, uh, because there's no way for us to do virtual. So we started like they would get, they wouldn't come. So we, they would get bench warrants. Of course, these things happen. Uh, but we would beat them in the bench warrant return meeting, meetings, meet like the judge or judge said, and like Dr. McGee said, is meeting them where they're at. Um, and just pitching that same message, like, this is who I am. This is what we're trying to offer. This is completely voluntary. If you complete all this, your, your sentence will be um, dismissed. And uh, th right now, that's where 98% of our uh, misdemeanor treatment for uh, volunteers or participants come from is us meeting them where they're at, just like and, and th those numbers are that those are accurate, very much so. Um, also, what other other ailments here, like well, since we're problem solving courts is these individuals go through all this work, and let's say they they do graduate and they do have a job and and they are making a difference and in that difference um it, our cost of living out here has quadrupled um you know uh, what a, a two bedroom apartment is $1800 a month um that's extremely difficult for an individual just getting back on their feet to afford it's it's very it's very difficult to, even after all that treatment and they are good to go on their own it, it, there are still obstacles there that they could fall back on because it is there is still more mountains to climb um, so it's also building, making sure they build that that social support networks to ensure that they stay where they're at or, or don't fall too far. And one of those, uh, so part of our program is, and one of those things that we kind of thought outside the box is when someone, because we're a community court and it's 100% free, we also have uh, community service as a part of the program to give back to the community. Well, the old school way of community service was, I don't know, cleaning graffiti, the streets, but if this person's here because of homelessness, and uh, our substance use issue, uh, you know, they're thinking to themselves, why am I cleaning graffiti? That's not why I'm here. So we come up with a model of like, what is a positive impact on, on our community is get connected, right? Being connected and being connected in a, in a uh, community. So they get double credit if they meet with peer-to-peer -peer support specialists, if they do parenting classes, um, if they go to job training classes, they get all credit for community service in our program for that. And all that does is continue to build up their network and just their motivation to change because they're no longer alone. And when the courts are done and we have to take a step back, even though our doors are always open because we're also a community resource center, they'll have those that are very like-minded to kind of uh, help them out along the way when they, when they do run into those obstacles that we all run into in life. Thank you, Scott. I, I did. I was tasked to um, address any questions and to wrap up. Um, I, there's one question that an audience member has posed about uh, whether or not there are um, some of the externalities from the pandemic uh, in terms of gun violence, political climate, and higher cost of living. Um, I just want to say very quickly, it, it would be it seems like a pipe dream for me to be able to offer any participant housing <laughs> in New York City um, because of the incredibly high cost of living. That's a very serious problem. And I think it is an enormous contributor to, um, to crime, uh, to recidivism. Um, and it is very painful to um, talk about all these things, but almost talk around what might be one of the primary motivators and for, or I'm sorry, primary sources of instability for many of the defendants that I have before me. Um, I think that political climate and some of the things that have come out of the pandemic, uh, loneliness, depression, um, all of those things are manifesting in um, uh, 
uh, what we're seeing out in the streets, which are higher incidents of people presenting uh, with mental illness, even if they were better able to kind of conceal it uh, before. And that's also kind of, I think, creating the political climate where a lot of people are worried and saying, well, you know, we don't know what to do with this person, but we just don't want them on the street. Yep. Uh, and I think that response is very unhelpful, but it's natural, right, um, to feel that way. And to kind of to, to want to address that the best way that we can is really important in the community courts because we can be the, the, the conversation. We can be the place where the public can have that conversation. We can dialogue with stakeholders in the community to talk to them and to say, we know this is an issue, but I want you to know that if we just take this person and uh, you know, lock them up and then they come out a few days later, they're going to be right back. And so how can we, what do you think we can do to engage? And this is how we try to engage with these um, folks. I also wanted to address one question that had come up about the, um, uh, the, the comment that I made about entanglement, uh, which is um, I've seen so many of the, um, the attendees uh, list and many of the attendees lists all the way hail from the Netherlands to all different kinds, all different places. Um, some of you are new and I am new to this as well um, uh, because I just started in the community courts in January. Um, so I, I, I do think that um, uh, part of the thing that I have learned um, and that I am continuing to learn is what is most effective in uh, the metrics that we traditionally identify as the ones that uh, determine success, right? Recidivism. And part of that conversation is a conversation I think that I'm having with myself and I'm having with colleagues and that we're having as a society and as a court system about um, how we want people to engage in services. Do we want to engage in services with sticks? Do we want to, you know, is that how we, is that the best way to get them to, um, to promote change? And so entanglement is part of that conversation is for low level offenses, how, uh, what are the responses if they don't participate? Um, and I think part of that, part of what I've learned and part of what I've been humbled by is the value of volition in the lives of the participants that we have, how valuable that is because um, telling them to do something and threatening them to do something, they could do it, um, but they're not invested in it. Um, and over the long run, that's just not going to help. Um, I want to I want to compliment Dr. McGee on in terms of what he had said about uh, not shaming folks that we have in the treatment courts. And this is, I think, following up on Dr. Gonzalez's comment about eliminating stigma and building empathy. When I have we, we I just ran the numbers for our part, which has about has now about 30 participants. Um, and when I look at the list of the participants that have come through, so many of these folks who have done one to five sessions, some of them have been accused of a sex crime. Um, and some of them have not been rearrested. A lot of them will probably go on not to be rearrested. A lot of them are successes. But when I see a lot of those folks, what I see is somebody who has supports outside of the court system, like I do. And that's kind of the difference between me and the person who's appearing before me. I could be on the other side of that bench, um, but for the fact that I had the supports in my life, that if I fall down, will be able to pick me up. So there's, it's just an experience for me that has really kind of opened up my own sense of empathy, uh, realizing that I, 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 it just sometimes it just really comes down to that, uh, not this idea of somebody making these bad choices um, and then not stigmatizing uh, them for that. Yeah. Uh, we have one minute left. I don't know if anybody wants to also sh share something because we. Um, I, well, I, I, and I and I agree with that, uh, Judge, and, and, it, and it's it's about that building that social support. And, and even if we have to entice them by they get credit for community service to do so, because eventually the court system, you know, has to is, you know, not to entangle them like or entrap them is, is you know, you, yeah. we're, we're done now. And, and but you can always come back for resources, but your, your case is closed and it's time to move on, you know. Uh, but you can come back anytime we're here to support or you need to use the phone or you need to uh, use our food bank or the shower trucks. Like these things are still open for everybody. And it, it's building that, su that support network for them that they're not alone. And having that understanding, genuineness, like the doctor said, and, and using that every day with every participant that walks through here. Yeah, I, I don't have time. I just want to say, Judge Wang, I so, I'm so moved uh, by what you just said. And 
uh, what I commonly say is that, uh, you know, the word judge has that negative uh, connotation of devaluing somebody. Um, and you're, it's just beautiful to hear what you say. I, I talk about judges need to move from being judgers to discerners, where you're discerning through deep empathy and understanding the problem and, and the needs for that. And, and that, that is wisdom with compassion. And uh, I just, I was very moved by that comment. Thank you so much. All right, I think I'm supposed to wrap up and there's a big red button that says leave. So <laughs> I think I hit that button. Bye. Um, thank you. Virtual very high five. Good job. Best of luck. <laughs>